Hello, everyone. Nice. Um, great. Like, it's filling in. I like that. Um, thank you, Elena, and all the organizers for having me here. This is my favorite hackathon. And actually, it was a few years ago, the first ever Ethereum event I went to. So it's very dear to my heart. I'm going to talk to you about censorships and how much we want it. So I have to start with a disclaimer because, I, as Helena said, I'm a Swiss lawyer. Um, but this talk is not going to be legal advice. It's going to be a little bit of philosophy, a lot of personal common sense uh, that I hope uh, you're going to um, agree with. And um, yeah, here we go. What is censorship? So I've Googled a lot to find a nice definition, and none of them were really appealing. Um, oftentimes, we talk about censorship in the context of freedom of speech, of books, like text, code. Um, but I think if we want to simplify censorship as a concept, it's about limiting access to data. So censorship would be about limiting the data people have access to, limiting data that is put out there, um, limiting data that um, we see or we create. And I'm from Iran originally, and there's a lot of censorship going on over there. Um, and this image is from the Iranian national TV, where they broadcast a lot of foreign movies and TV series where copyright is not a thing over there. And um, usually they would cover what they, they would want to censor. Um, either they would blur it, pixelize it, or sometimes be more creative and uh, put a lamp in front of the woman. Another lamp. Again, you can see there is a woman there. They really like this one particular lamp. This is a, their favorite lamp. Another one. This one actually fits with the other lamps in the background. Oops. So yeah, a lot of lamps. Censorship, but censorship doesn't only happen in Iran. It's all over the internet. Um, everything we do on the internet is somehow defined by some form of censorship. And female bodies are not only censored in Iran, but actually also on Instagram, right? So if you have used Instagram, and I think it's quite popular, um, you would see that female breasts are censored there too. So there's a lot of censorship that happens not only over there, but here too, on our phones, on our usage of the internet, um, there are people who decide what we can see and what we cannot see. But curation and moderation is necessary. I don't think we want to live in a world where there is no curation or moderation. We want to control our reality, what we're exposed to, what we're seeing, the advertisements that are in the streets, for instance, or the nudity that we see online. Um, we want to control the news also that we're exposed to. We want to also control what we expose others to in general. All of us living in society, being social creators, creatures, um, we do censor ourselves a lot, right? Like in order to be able to live together, there is censorship happening both ways. But proper curation and moderation requires the following. Um, it requires agency. Right? If it's not only a one-sided curation or moderation, I want to do my own curation and moderation of my reality. And in order to do that, I need to have access to information. And to have access to proper information, there needs to be transparency. So in, when there is transparency, I know what is out there, and I know and I can choose uh, what I want to see, what I want to be exposed to, what I want to expose others to. Because of this, I think censorship is good and will always exist and has always been around. It favors the commons, it favors society. Um, some form of censorship 
is there to protect ourselves, to protect others, to protect nature, our society. Um, so we must censor, said it before, limit our desires that have potential for harm in general terms, and also do some form of informed curation. But what is censored today is not necessarily what was censored before and what is going to be censored in the future. And this is because norms and cultures and laws and just the realm that we navigate changes over time and over space. In this one particular time, what is OK here is not necessarily OK somewhere else either. And what was OK in the past is not necessarily OK now or desirable now. Same in the future. What we're doing now most likely will not be the norm in the future. So what is censored on these terms is actually modular over space and time. So now let's go into Ethereum. This is a hackathon. Um, this is an Ethereum hackathon. Um, and is Ethereum censored or is Ethereum not censored? Well, Ethereum. <laughs> I think it's a little bit censored. Um, so there are like three kind of forms of categories of censorship that can happen on the blockchain. So one would be on the consensus layer, so on the blockchain itself, on the application layer, the dApps or the smart contracts, and then the social layer, so all of the surrounding groups that influence and are working with the blockchain, um, the UIs and so on. This is an example of the consensus layer censorship. Um, I took this screenshot from this web page, censorship.pix, um, a few days ago. So these numbers change um, a lot, but it just gives you an idea within Ethereum of um, basically the validators and uh, how much they decide to build blocks, relay, or validate blocks that have transactions related to, um, in this particular case, I think it's uh, to sanctioned addresses by the OFAC. So the OFAC is the Office of Foreign Asset Control. It's an authority in the US. It's the authority that put Tornado Cash under sanctions, and it has a list of addresses, basically, that are banned. Um, within the US or two US persons, um, and then there are validators, relayers, and builders that do implement um, this ban on Ethereum. This is another um, figure from mevwatch.info. And um, so this is 35%. I remember like a few months ago, I think it went up to 51%, and everyone kind of freaked out. Um, I think these are interesting to monitor, but then it doesn't mean that even if it's 51% that there is, um, like the Ethereum is fully censored. Basically what it means is that specific transactions that are considered banned will remain in the mempool longer until there is um, some non-censorship uh, validation happening. Um, it's written post-merge of a compliant block. Um, I don't think this is a legal um, consideration. So what is actually a compliant block is not really defined, but it still gives an idea. Um, I would just give a shout out to this paper by um, Tony Warstetter and co that would that actually um, uh, lists and analyzes censorship on Ethereum post tornado cash sanctions and uh, gives a lot of figures and a lot of possible way forwards and a lot of risks. And one point that is very interesting is that not only censorship is bad because the technology is supposed to be censorship proof, uh, but also the fact that there are some transactions that would remain longer in the mempool create some form of security risk too. They are more prone to attacks, uh, being sandwiched, uh, front run, and so on. So I do recommend, if you're interested in the topic, to uh, start the research with this. 
Another example, this is more on the DAP layer or on the social layer. I'm not going to go really into details, but there was a lot of censorship happening against, um, in this particular instance, Iranians or Iran-related things. So um, an example is Gitcoin that had removed the grant uh, for Solidity courses in Farsi. Um, there are a few other examples, consensus that um, and refuse Iranian-based students in its program, although they were enrolled, and all of this out of abundance of caution to ensure compliance with US law. More examples, MetaMask, banning some IPs, OpenSea, the same. So there is censorship on all different layers of the stack. And what is the issue with censorship on chain? I think I mean, it's kind of pretty obvious when we enter that realm and it starts to be censorship, then especially when it's on the consensus layer, we must ask ourselves who gets to decide. Is it OFAC that is like the supreme authority for blockchain compliance? Are we like gonna submit to whatever OFAC decides? What does it decide? Like, can we actually discuss even with them? Is it demo democratic? If it's not OFAC, who else? And we're building a global technology that is supposed to be used by everyone around the globe. Like, who can say that which culture, which norms, which laws have a superior standing over others? Um, and how can we just implement that in a fair way for everyone? So I think we should censor blockchain censorship. So if blockchain, if the technology is not robust enough, then it's not unstoppable. It will get corrupted. There are points of control. There are people that would submit to this control. I'm not questioning the reason why they would do this, but just the fact that this is a possibility is a problem. And how to make it robust? I thought of two things to explore further, but I'm sure there are many other ways. And it's up to you hackers to find it out. One is surveillance resistance. If you don't know what's happening, you cannot censor, right? Like if you do something at home, there's nobody, curtains are closed, door is closed, who is there to see and to criticize or stop you? Same goes on chain or in all other realms of life. The other one is about inclusion lists. I don't know if you're familiar with those, no? Well, if you're not, you can look at, um, here is a list of blog posts. I think you can find this list. This is a screenshot from censorship.pix to look further into that. And this is just a way to make sure that no transaction gets censored forever. And like no matter how compliant uh, the validation will be, there will still be um, this transaction like forced into the blocks. But this still needs a lot of work. It's just research in progress. Do research, uh, refine it. I think it's an interesting way for Ethereum to adapt. So as I said, censorship resistance requires surveillance resistance for a permissionless, secure, up and only ledger, which is actually the true blockchain and what I hope we're all aiming to have here. But we want to control our flow of data. So it's not one design applies for all, or once, like who makes the decision of what is okay, what is not okay. I think every user, every DAB, everyone should have the option to do this. And uh, there is some, th this is not a question mark, although it works somehow, but uh, curation and moderation to go back to what I said at the beginning, um, in order for us to be sovereign individuals, which is a promise of Bitcoin, of the blockchain, of the whole cypherpunk ethos, we need information, transparency, modularity, and optionality. I, th I think this applies on chain as well. I copied this part of the manifesto. I, if you haven't read it yet, I think you should absolutely read it. Um, this is the ETH Berlin, this, this event's manifesto that is brilliant. And um, I'm just going to read it with you. Reflecting on the decentralized ecosystems, the very systems designed to solve some of the underlying problems of the failing society, 
corruption, oppression, authoritarianism, centralization, we, we realize that instead of creating actionable alternatives, we seemingly are reinvigorating hierarchical power structures, setting questionable incentives, recreating existing failures, and hence are more and more part of the problem. And I think the thing that must be tackled absolutely is censorship resistance that goes hand in hand with permissionlessness, that goes hand in hand with decentralization. So yeah, hackers unite, go hack, censor the censors. Um, and this is also from the manifesto, and I think these are really good bullet points just to conduct and structure our building, our research, and hopefully the future of the technology. Thank you. Oh, also, <laughs> um, there's gonna be, um, um, like, we're, we're so I'm judging the hackathon with a few other lawyers, and tomorrow at three to four, I think, uh, there's gonna be some mentorship. So feel free to come, uh, ask questions, and I'm done now. Thank you.